Today we're going to talk about crimes against nature. This is a world. This is a world premiere. This is a world. Hey y'all, welcome to another, you know, food for thought. And today I want to talk to you guys about this is going to be just one of those little chats and I don't know, maybe it'll go on for a long time or maybe it'll be pretty short, but I just want to throw out an idea to all of you to think about. But before we get into that, I want to get down in the comments section because I got some really interesting, um, a couple of really int interesting comments. Um, first of all, going back to um, the, you know, is, Pew is uh, PewDiePie the R word? And, you know, I used the R word because if you use racist in a title, then it's definitely going to get flagged. So maybe that got past the censors. I don't know. But maybe now PewDiePie's name gets you censored. But um, I got a response from... Dr. Science PhD, and Dr. Science PhD points out that PewDiePie took a test to see if he is racist. Um, he filmed it, and he actually says, motherfucker filmed it and uploaded it for everyone to see. The results were positive. His mind has much harder time associating good things with black people and has much easier time associating bad things with black people. This is not the first time he has used the N-word on video, that is, and who can ever forget all that Nazi stuff, Nazi shit, the person says. He also followed... Um, CHS on Twitter. I don't know if he still does. He flirts with the alt-right um, all the time. He follows Sargon of Akkad. Felix is racist, but so are most people. Okay, so that was a really interesting um, thing to point out. Now, you guys may remember back a few months, maybe six months ago, I don't know, but I took that same, I think it was the same test, where it looks it, it looks to see um, how people are with associating po positive things and negative things with both black people and white people, and also with African Americans and white people, which is a very different thing. I took the test twice. When um, I took the test using, um, and I was offered black people versus white people, I, I showed bias on the side of seeing black people as more negative and having a more difficult time seeing um, black people as positive. And then I took the test again later at using African American, and apparently this is true for a lot of people. Um, in, when using African American or thinking in terms of African American, I had a much easier time thinking um, of uh, black people as positive, and so the, the test skewed in favor of African Americans. So. I don't know if calling out PewDiePie's, you know, racist test is a way to determine that he's necessarily a bad person or is more racist than the, the average individual. What was funny was I, um, I challenged uh, Dr. Um, Science PhD uh, to take the test. And Dr. Science PhD responded with, I have not, but I'm pretty sure the results will be positive as well. I am in denial about a lot of things, but my racism ain't one of them. And so this is interesting. So um, Dr. Science PhD is pretty sure that their results are going to be, I guess, positive as showing them as not necessarily racist or not necessarily biased against black people or African Americans. Again, I am going to challenge that. It's exactly in the places where we feel most sure of ourselves, the places where we hold, uh, you know, an idea about our identity, where we should be questioning the most, I think. I think. Um, you know, what's the Hamlet quote? The lady, doth, uh, the lady doth protest too much, methinks. I think that's Gertrude in, the, in um, uh, talking about the player queen who's professing, uh, you know, her love to the king who then ends up being murdered and she ends up murdered to his brother, right? So, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say, uh, you know, not to protest so much and just to not ever be quite so sure of ourselves, to constantly be questioning those things. And then something really funny happened yesterday in the video. Apparently, I used uh, the phrase, um, I think I maybe used the phrase, catch up with my pet or something like that, and Matthew T called it out and said, LOL, catch, catch up with my animal. Wow, really, Reg, in tears for that sovereign being. And I thought this was kind of funny, but I thought there's also actually, and I'm, I'm, I'm imagining that Matthew T was joking and, you know, whatever. Um, but again, questioning, of course I'm speciesist. Of course I see, you know, you know, there's this animal in my house that doesn't eat unless I, you know, unless I feed him, right? Doesn't um, go out, doesn't get to go outside unless I take the dog outside. You know, every, pretty much everything about this particular sentient 
being is due to like my generosity or my husband's generosity, right? And so to think about, um, to feel a sense of entitlement around this particular being, you know, I do. I feel entitlement around, you know, I'm gonna say around my dog, right, my dog. Um, in the same way, I feel entitled around, entitlement around my husband, and I feel entitlement around my house, right? But they, those are, that's not to say that those things should not be questioned. Those things should certainly be questioned. So I'm really grateful to Matthew T for, um, for calling those things out. So, yes. So, yes. Um, and then, so I'm going to let that... I'm gonna let that go. Um, I don't know. Did anyone see the Roger Waters um, interview on Democracy Now! yesterday? I started talking a little bit about the conversation was um, in reference to you know the Israeli-Palestine uh, um, conflict. I haven't watched the interview yet. I'm planning on watching that today, and I will probably talk to all of you about that later on. Also, you know, I mentioned that I was gonna be doing kind of reviews in each of my videos, and um, I don't want to, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about this. I don't know how I feel about this. Um, yeah, I don't know how I feel about this. Yeah, I'm going to let that go. I'm going to let that go. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to be doing an inter I'm going to be doing a review of the film It, though, coming up. I'm going to be doing a, a review of the film It. I will say this, okay, just to have something in here related to film reviews, I finally went to see, um, what is it, Guardians of the Galaxy 2? Mm -mm. Chris and I went to see it a couple of weeks ago when we were in Ohio, and we were both really looking forward to it. You know, I think you all know that I'm a huge sci-fi fan, and so yes, yeah, sometimes I'm just going to talk about science fiction. And yeah, really disappointed in that film. Um, assumed far too much. Assumed we loved these characters far too much. It seemed to me that the film, for the most part, was setting us up for a Guardians of the Galaxy 3, which they make very clear is going to be happening. We're introduced to some characters in this version, this Guardian of the Galaxy, Galaxy Volume 2, that we're, you know, supposed to, you know, know something about. They don't do much. Clearly, they're probably going to be doing more. Sylvester Stallone, for example, showed up in this film. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to give um, Guardians of the Galaxy 2. I don't know if people have seen it or not. Didn't, you know, I'm sure most of you who are interested in that kind of thing have already gone to see it. But if you want to know what I think of Guardian of the Galaxy 2, and I'm sure most of you aren't interested in my opinions on something like Guardian of Galaxy 2, but um, I give it a thumbs down. So, yeah, um, uh, I would say don't bother. Maybe if it's, you know, if you have an opportunity to see it for free on a small screen, maybe so that you can understand what I'm talking about. So, I am in a transition right now. And this video was almost called My Red Pill Journey. And so I just want to prepare you all for that before I get into this. And I'm opting to, um, I'm opting to focus more on the idea in this video on this idea of the natural world and what is considered sort of crime against the natural world. It's something that comes up a lot as vegans because we're constantly being told that, you know, eating animals is natural, right? And there are arguments to say that should we be focusing on what is natural to determine what is right, right? And so I think what is natural, we can understand that what is natural isn't necessarily going to be considered what's right. It is natural to murder someone, but is it right to murder someone is a completely different question. And I think that the answer to that question changes based on the given circumstances, right? And it also changes based on who is defining the particular act, who is categorizing the particular act as an act of murder, right? What could be an act of self-defense could be categorized, um, legally characterized as murder, first, second degree, right? Doesn't matter, but based on who is in charge, who has the say, determines what is legal, what is not legal. So you see where I'm going with that? So before we get into what is against the law, what is not against the law, there have been many things over the course of history that have been absolutely legal that we look back and see them as reprehensible, right? Slavery, for an example, right? So 
absolutely legal to uh, you know persecute people based on the color of their skin in the United States, for example, at least. Um, was that was that you know was it a, a thing that is right to do? But the the other question, the thing that I want to get to is, was it natural? Was it natural? And my answer would be, it was natural. Natural slavery slavery was natural, and here's why it was natural. And we have to go back a long, long time in history, right? So we go back to the beginning of civilization, and we imagine that there was a time when these beings, these sentient beings that were becoming what we know of as Homo sapiens were struggling to survive in this, you know, the natural world, right? And they were doing pretty much anything that they could to survive. Um, and I don't think we can look back on the things that were done by those, you know, our early ancestors and say, you know, whether what they did was right or wrong. It got us to the place where we exist now, right? It got us to the place where we exist. And those struggles that they engaged in were natural. And there were certain systems and there were certain rituals and traditions that were developed that were part of maintaining the species, right? And then later on, uh, when we started to become factions or when we started to maybe even think of ourselves consciously in terms of factions, it was more, it wasn't simply a matter of each individual fighting for their survival. It was groups of individuals fighting for their survival. So the identity of the group became tied up with the identity of what I'm going to say a particular individual. And I even want to say that the individual gathering others around them to fight for a common cause is maybe the very beginnings of, you know, exploitation, right? So we have this one individual. I can't necessarily uh, achieve the goals that I am trying to achieve in the world on my own. So I use my strength. I use whatever belief in mysticism. I believe I, I use whatever it is, there is at my disposal to um, exploit others around me to achieve the goals that I would like to achieve, right? So this began very, very early on as we became, you know, social beings, as we, as we started to develop societies, right? And so was that natural? Yes, it was absolutely natural. But even at that time, it was absolutely natural for individuals within that group to become dissatisfied with what was happening and to rise up and to fight against whoever was making the decisions for that group, right? And that leader, whoever was the leader, whoever was in charge would be overthrown. And I imagine that because of the way we are built uh, physiologically as human beings, that men were often in charge because they were just bigger and they were just stronger, right? They were just they were able to wrest control from other members of the group. It is very likely that the, large, that the largest person, the largest and strongest person was the person who was in charge. And then of course, as we begin to see society develop and become more sophisticated, it becomes not only a matter of survival, it becomes a matter of, not, of, of maintaining the world in the way that the person or the people in charge wanted to see that world. So it wasn't only about uh, protecting the food stores and uh, making sure that, you know, we had enough women who were having babies and keeping, you know, us growing, right? You know, um, and, and, and um, strengthening and increasing the size of our particular group, right? So it wasn't just about that. It became about, you know, the style of dress. Someone decided that it was aesthetically pleasing to them for the world to appear in a certain way. Right? Certain belief structures began to appeal to particular individuals who were in the positions of power. So the question is, was that natural? And I say, yes, it was absolutely natural. It is absolutely natural that we want to have the environment around us satisfying to us some way, in ways that make us feel safe, that make us feel secure in our identity, in our power, in our ability to control the natural world, right? So yes absolutely natural. And so then we begin to have rituals and institutions that crop up like, you know, the ownership of a particular, you know, you get to own a certain number of people, you get to own a certain amount of land, right? And so now we have, you know, 
understandings about how the world begins to be divided and held by particular groups, right? And not necessarily um, that everybody has a little house and a little plot of land with a certain number of, you know, uh, non-human animals that are at their disposal for use, but in, in the various ways, in the various cultures around the world that we see societies begin to develop. And all of these things, I believe, are natural. And so we have things like, you know, matrimony, you know, these institutions of marriage and, you know, all of the other institutions, the things that, you know, men, men as the dominant role models, all of these things are ways of thought, ideology, systems of belief that have been maintained and generally speaking through violence, I want to say, generally speaking through the violence of men, simply because that is in the natural world who had the power, right? And so if we flash forward to the world that we live in today, it is absolutely natural that there would be a dominant culture that wants to see that culture maintained through any means necessary. And they are certainly going to favor those individuals that embrace that culture. And this is where I think sometimes we even have to let go of the idea of race because it's not necessarily about race and it's not necessarily about economics either. It's about cultural norms. It's about who is going to maintain the world that I want to see and who has the say about how the world is going to be maintained. And so there are individuals that regardless of the cost to the majority of the inhabitants of the planet, human or non-human, the planet itself, regardless, will do whatever is necessary to maintain a particular cultural norm, a particular dominant set of understandings, right? A dominant cultural mode. And they, those individuals will use whatever is at their disposal. And unfortunately, in the world we live in now, we have folks with nuclear bombs at their disposal who, will, who can maintain the world as it is right now. And I say that all of these things are natural. It is absolutely natural. And so we have these values that are maintained through these systems of violence. And so those individuals who don't adhere to those values, don't adhere to those cultural norms, find themselves targeted for whatever reason. And sometimes the cultural norm is the color of the skin, the standard of beauty, right? Those are all things that are part of cultural norms that, again, are maintained usually through systems of violence at all cost, even at the expense of the planet. And so with that in mind, of course racism is natural. Of course it's natural because we have a group that is struggling to maintain a particular aesthetic about society, about the world around them, the world that is within their purview. The only thing that I would say is not natural is when those of us who don't adhere to those cultural norms of the dominant, the, the dominant class, let's say, to feel that we are unnatural, to feel that we are somehow broken because we don't fit into that dominant mode. In fact, I think it is exactly the opposite. I think that our refusal to adhere to those norms, our willingness to evolve in our thinking, our willingness to break out of the social box is essential. It's not only natural, but it's essential. Because regardless of what a limited group of individuals wants to see about the world, the way that they want to see the world, what they want to maintain about the world, regardless of that, the most natural thing is evolution, is our evolution. Evolution, however, goes against the 
ideals and the needs of a dominant class that are trying to maintain a particular worldview, are trying to maintain a particular aesthetic. So let's say, for example, we want to talk about, you know, issues of gender and sexual orientation. If the dominant culture wants everyone getting together, hooking up and having babies so that we can keep growing our society, right? Um, that may actually go against what the natural world requires, right? The natural world requires uh, us to slow down. <laughs> you know, we can't, we can't. We're, we're, you know, moving towards overpopulation. And forgive me for over, oversimplifying this, but I'm just trying to make a simple point. So if what is required of us is to um, minimize our reproduction, find ways to minimize our reproduction, then it'll, it's only natural that there will be, you know, uh, individuals who identify as women who have the, the, you know, the the right, you know, organs in place to be able to bear children who will say, no, I'm not doing that. And like, there might even be a natural impulse amongst certain individuals who are, identi who are identified as female to not have children for something else to happen and to start looking for other ways to contribute to, to, to society um, rather than simply um, providing the, you know, means of production, the human resources that are required for the continuance of growth and capitalism under capitalism, right? We might also see um, that there will be, you know, individuals who are identified as male for whatever reason because of the equipment that they've been, that they've been born with, who don't have any interest in impregnating those individuals who are identified as female, right? And so this becomes part of the natural order of things, right? But those individuals may start to recognize themselves selves as somehow um, um, aberrant or might start to recognize themselves as as unnatural or going against nature when what they are doing or the way they are feeling is absolutely, and it's essential, it is essential and so acting in our best interest, we might fight to maintain our, self of our, our sense of our identity and might uh, fight to act according to the impulses that feel right to us, that feel natural to us, right? And so we see that we live in a system of capitalism, which people feel is, you know, just very natural. That's the way people are. But there are others who are going to fight against that system and fighting against that system is natural as well and absolutely necessary. It is necessary to struggle against that system. And so I want to leave with this idea. Instead of us constantly looking at things in terms of the lines that are drawn in books, you know, the social, the political lines that have been drawn for us, I'm on the left and I am on the right, to start to think about the many ways that we might be developing and evolving as human beings. And do we see ourselves as individuals who are willing to accept the changes that occur within the species? Or do we see ourselves as fighting the changes that are occurring? And again, both of those things are absolutely natural. And so that's what I want to leave you with today. That's what I want to leave you with. So um, let me know what you think. That's it for this video. Like it if you like it. Share, comment, subscribe. This is Reg signing off. I love yourselves. Peace. And I love myself.